So I think we could welcome uh, Isabel Money. Are you here, Isabel? Here you are. Hello, Isabel. How are you? Oh, yeah. Great to see you again, Arno. How are you doing? I'm fine. So you're all set up. Maybe you I... can share your screen. I'm all set. We're ready to go. Perfect. So the stage, the stage is yours for the next 20, 25 minutes. Thank you very much, Arno, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good late morning, wherever you are in this world. Uh, so my name is Isabel. I'm the field CTO at uh, 42 Crunch, which is a company that delivers uh, a platform for API security. And we're here to talk about APIs and in particular, how to protect what I call financial grade APIs. That is like APIs which are manipulating maybe data which is as sensitive as financial um, institution would do. But maybe you're not in the financial industry, maybe it's insurance, maybe it's healthcare or, or, or any type of information that you deal in uh, being sensitive. Uh, so um, 42 Crunch is also the company behind uh, uh, another uh, website you may know about a newsletter, which is apisecurity.io. And one of the things we do here is really a community effort to educate uh, people on, on API security and breaches and you know what is happening to others and, and, and ensuring we have enough education so it doesn't happen to us. And it's a, a bit what I'm going to do in this presentation as well, is to show you what others uh, have experienced and, and how we can learn from that. Um, and, and, and not repeat those errors uh, ourselves, right? So since we opened uh, API Secure.io is, is more than two years ago now, uh, time flies, uh, we've reported about 300 plus public breaches, right? So basically things that make up in the news and we harvest the news and, and put it all in the same place for you. And if you look at the problems that um, all those companies and their very big names and smaller names uh, across those usually big names because those are the ones that actually make it up in the news, in the public news. There's a combination of causes that you see across all those problems and, and pretty much just two, day, two, two areas. It's, it's about data and how an API exposes and manipulates data. And it's about authorization and authentication as we would imagine. And then some, what I call aggravated factors, right? So. If, if you have an authorization authentication problem or if you have a data problem of authorization uh, to the data, and on top of that, you don't have any rate limiting, for example, then that original problem is gonna be 100 times worse if somebody can start scrapping data through your API because there's nothing that actually prevents them from, from doing so, right? Now, why is this happening? So there's this, you know, um, prediction from, from Gartner that in by 2022, APIs will like the number one vector to attack uh, applications and systems. And, and actually, I'm, I'm gonna change that and say it's probably going to be earlier than that. And for the simple reason we have accelerated the speed, at least from what we see at our customers, the speed at which we're creating new APIs and changing our applications is, is really, extremely fast. So this is accelerating to a rate that probably this problem is going to become mainstream as early as next year. And, and the reason this is really a big problem is because of the way we have changed the architecture of our applications. We used to have something that we controlled on the server side. Uh, all the access was there control. We would only export and show some JavaScript and HTML and basically the presentation logic back to the clients. But now most of that business logic that was in some layers on the server side has jumped over to the client side. Uh, and, and what we do at the server side is simply expose data and processes and, and let applications, client applications, whichever they are, consume that information in the way they want. And, and that basically means we are exposing to the internet. Um, and, and this is a very key point. Any API that exposes data on the public internet is a public API. It doesn't 
require you to put an API in a developer portal and make that developer portal public for an API to become public. Any open endpoint exposed in a DNS somewhere is a public API. So we have millions of those all over the internet now. And, and basically I can hit those endpoints directly and see how they answer to me, right? And, and so the security of APIs basically has evolved from what, what is a traditional architecture of both cities and, and companies, which was to build walls around our data centers and we will have multiple walls. And if you were to pass the first wall, then maybe you would not pass the second wall. And we'll just put all those network firewalls, application firewalls, all kind of walls around our data. But when you create APIs, you basically change completely the paradigm because now you have still your data center with your processes and your data. But every time you create APIs, you just create direct avenues to that information. And, and that's true also the other way around. If you're consuming maybe some of your data from your enterprise from external systems, maybe you have some CRM and an external CRM and it's not yours. So all your customer data is really all over the place right now. It's not only uh, segregated in a single place that you can protect with walls. So we need to change the way we think about security in order to protect APIs correctly. Now, when we say API security, um, this is a very hot topic right now. It's a very, uh, um, I would say, fashionable thing and for many good reasons. But it's actually very becoming very confusing because everybody is kind of claiming they're doing API security. And there's different layers and things you have to do to do security here. So, of course, there's, you know, hardware and, and virtualization and VMs and, and physical access and all that stuff because, well, somewhere, even if it's not in your system, in your data centers, there are machines that have to be protected and the layers of architecture on top of that bare metal needs to be protected and, and secured as well. But what we are concerned about today is more about the two layers on top, which are communication and application layer. And there comes the first maybe level of confusion, right? Because a lot of the you know customers I'm working with, they say, oh, well, we do everything over TLS, for example. Right? So everything navigates over TLS, so we should be good there, right? So that's the first step, of course but it's not enough. And especially if you do an architecture which is a microservices based architecture, you will have to also um, validate who can talk to who in that, in that architecture. And this is what I talk, what I mean by communication layer architecture is I have microservices A, can it talk to microservices B or not? And, and if they talk, how do they talk and how do they exchange data? But at that level, I have no idea about what the application actually does. That is not the role of that layer. This is typically what a service mesh is doing, for example. That layer is all about communication. That doesn't know anything about the app and the data flowing over it. So we need another layer of security on top of that, which is app level security, which is what is the data flowing through now uh, our system? Which libraries are we using? Which is, is our code secure? Which images? Uh, you know, which data are we using? So all of that is, is, is at that level, right? Now, so much is this different that about a year ago now, uh, we're going to celebrate the first anniversary very, very soon, uh, API Security Top 10 came up. So this is like complementary, if you want, to your traditional OWASP Top 10 that you, you know and love. Um, and But it, it recognizes all those typical problems of APIs I was mentioning about, and especially around data. So again, an API is all about transporting data. So it is no surprise that the problems around APIs are all about, many of them are around how do I secure and control the data I am accepting and the data I'm actually returning, and, and which data do I overexpose through APIs, for example. Right, so I'll just take a few examples of breaches from the past year or so um, and, and explain a bit through those what those A1 to A10 are uh, illustrated in most of them. And we will start with Uber. So this is something that happened about a, a bit more than a year ago um, where uh, um, a white hacker basically um, worked on, on a bug bounty with Uber on and discovered that 
uh, they could access pretty much the entire profile of uh, Uber driver in, in this case, um, simply by knowing their internal ID, which is a UID. So th the thing is two stages, the attack is two stages. The first one is basically getting the API to give us that internal UID we should never have known about because we should only maybe interrogate the API through an email or a phone number. And the second part of it is once I have a UID, I can basically, if I have a, a correct access token, I can basically go and interrogate and retrieve the profile of anyone by just knowing that UID, right? Which is this typical um, a door, I door problem that we're going to talk about. So as part of that leak, for example, um, they leaked also inside the JSON structure. So it's kind of a lot of JSON, <laughs> um, the mobile token and the token for authentication in there. So this is also a, a uh, double mistake, I would say, first of all, that API returns tons of data with the entire profile of the user. And second, inside that profile, you have very sensitive information, such as the token to authenticate yourself through phone, right? Um, so what is this top one problem? The top one problem in, in OWASP um, is something you may have heard about as IDOR. Uh, now it's been like renamed in, in that OWASP top 10 to BOLA to say broken object level authorization, just to highlight the fact that the core of the issue here is an authorization problem. So if, if um, I am a driver for Uber, right, and I have a certain UID, and Arno is a driver for Uber, I cannot you know, go in the Uber application, and because I know somehow the unique ID of Arno's profile, uh, retrieve all the information about him, which is probably very sensitive information, right? So this is typically at heart, it is an authorization problem. Somewhere in the flow, there should be a fine grain authorization check that says, oh, this is Isabel. Isabel is only allowed to access her profile, but she cannot go and, and look at any other user's profile, right? Now, that's the heart of the problem. Now, this problem is made worse, as you can imagine, if the IDs I'm using, which is not the case of Uber, by the way, because they use a UID, like a long, non-guessable ID, um, but it's aggravated by the fact that you have guessable IDs. And 90%, and maybe more of the cases, if the IDs were not guessable, then this problem would be really mitigated. It will not be solved because it's really an authorization problem but sometimes it's hard to add this authorization layer on top of everything if you haven't done that uh, originally. So by making sure your IDs are not guessable, uh, avoiding exposing external IDs through your APIs, you're gonna alleviate the problem, right? And again, uh, very careful with the aggravated factor, which is a huge aggravated factor here, especially if the IDs are guessable, which is not to have rate limiting, because that you can imagine, I like, can have a loop that goes one to three, one to four, one to five, one to six, forever, and retrieve all the profiles in, in a couple of minutes, right, pretty much. Um, so this has happened a lot. It's popping up on API security.io a lot. It's a very common issue. Um, so to fix that, really, it's about authorization, about fixing those IDs. Um, what is the other problem here with Uber? It's leaking that huge JSON schema, but that huge JSON structure that has all the information about a driver. So this basically, why is this happening? What's happening basically because we are, we say, okay, well, some application somewhere is going to need the profile of a user. So rather than tailoring uh, multiple endpoints and multiple operations, and making sure I just return the right amount of data and the right amount of uh, information depending on the client, for example. Um, well, what we say is, okay, we'll just return all the information and the client application will filter that data. They will pick up from that use JSON structure, maybe three, four or five things that they need and they will discard the others. But of course, well, that works technically, but of course, that means that if I call this API directly, I get all the information, not just the information that I'm supposed to have. Right? So we'll need to, from a design perspective here, and I'm sure Arno uh, will we'll let you know all about this in, in, in the book, is 
you know, do like a back end for front end or this kind of things to just make sure that whatever data we return, we know the data we return. It is well designed. We, are, we know if there are any sensitive PII, any type of data in there. Um, and, and we just return the proper amount of information for each of our respective clients, right? You have to take care of that. And because of, uh, you know, in, in GraphQL, make sure that if you're using GraphQL, you don't allow somebody to ask for any type of information. So they cannot evade and leak uh, all type of data there. You're not supposed to leak through your API, right? So be careful if you're using GraphQL to control how much I can ask in terms of the, the data I want to retrieve. All right, and same thing can happen, maybe it's less obvious through JWTs because we're gonna have this payload, which is a, you know, XML, JSON payload, whatever it is. And this is like, you know, usually in clear, it's just base 64 encoded, it is not encrypted. So if I have um, the, J the JWT and I put it in any tool like the infamous JWT.io, for example, I can very easily see all that payload, which in this case of this vulnerable API I'm using even shows me the password because it came straight from the database in the backend. So be also very careful of how much data and what data you're storing and transporting through JWTs. And in general, keep those internal. Don't push them to the outside world. So people, first of all, don't depend on that information. And second, you don't have the risk of leaking some important data and sensitive data uh, to your clients uh, through JWTs. OK, um, next we will talk about Facebook. So what this is is um, basically some authentication issue. And, and the root of it is that there are two endpoints at Facebook, one that has a rate limiting for any password reset operations. And another one that doesn't. Um, so again, this is a combination of problems, as very often in any of those problems, is the combination, again, of not having rate limiting. As I was saying, rate limiting is really a huge aggravated factor uh, for any of those problems. So we don't have any rate limiting on this beta endpoint. Um, and we have left that, um, we, we have misconfigured basically the, the this password reset and we have left this um, uh, endpoint beta badly configured with no rate limiting when the official production system does have rate limiting. Okay, so broken authentication, what happens here, um, really it's all about, first of all, uh, authentication. So this is a much larger problem than, than what Facebook had. Uh, but the problem is really to choose the proper authentication based on what is the data and what is the operation? And in security, it's all about risk, right? So what is the risk uh, and, and how do you basically mitigate that risk? So do you need an API key? Do you need OAuth? Which type of OAuth, et cetera, et cetera. So you need to choose that first. Evaluate your options and choose the proper solution. And then your usual thing, you know about this, you know, for all authentication, two-factor authentication captchas, even if we don't like them too much, but they're getting much better now. Um, and also there is a whole set of problems around credentials management. And this is across the board, right? How are those credentials stored? Where do they live? Um, if I have some tokens and they're being uh, stolen or lost, uh, would that be useful for five minutes, for 10 minutes, or for six months? Because you know what I can do as a hacker depending on that is very different, right? So make sure you give people some short-lived tokens, limit what they can do with them, maybe use mutual TLS to talk to people. That's something you could do if you have some controlled partners. It's not that easy to do in, in other circumstances. Um, and if you are going to use OAuth, then, then most likely the only thing that, that is recommended now is using authorization code grant type. So the way to obtain a token now, there's like one way which is configured to be the most secured way. Um, and again, back to our JWTs, just make sure that you validate them properly according to best practices, right? So it's not enough to just receive a jot and just validate the signature. You need, you need to do much more than that. And actually we're doing a, a webinar at 42Crunch on this tomorrow. If you wanna join in, uh, we'll talk exactly about this. 
Um, all right, and, and beware again of where you put all those credentials, right? They can leak in, in URLs, for example. That means they will be uh, written into logs. That's a very critical thing. Just make sure they are not making it to URLs. They are in headers and the post request so they don't end up um, in, in being written down in any um, uh, access logs, for example. Right, and, and back to rate limiting, this is really critical um, because rate limiting is all, um, you have to use a proper rate limiting, right? And a lot of people use rate limiting by IP. Now, it is very, very easy today for anyone to just bring up hundreds, thousands of machines with any uh, public cloud provider for a very limited amount of money. And if the you know the the password reset like it was at Facebook gives you ten minutes to guess a six digit um, um, one time password, if you have five thousand machines trying to do that on different combinations uh, under ten minutes, it's going to be very easy to do. Maybe it's going to take a couple of minutes to actually find that reset and then take over the account, right? So if you do rate limiting, just make sure it's the proper rate limiting in terms of how much you allow. Um, and if you can do this by token and not by IP or anything which is more, you know, um, more difficult to forge than, than an IP address. Okay. All right. I'll pass on our friends from, um, from, from Struts in terms of, uh, from Equifax in terms of the problem. But um, one thing that is really critical in terms of um, what happened to those guys is is twofold the first one and we all know about this whatever data comes our way we have to validate that's what they didn't do but the second one which is getting really complex to address right now is making sure that the configuration of our system is actually proper you know it can be tls uh making sure you you, you keep up with um you know credentials and and default parts and and, and change all that stuff but also more importantly, and this is very news of my one week ago, be very, very careful about the data that you import in your applications, right? NPM, install, whatever. You have to put a system in place to actually look at those, validate them, and make sure you're not importing something that you should not import. So all those external dependencies, you have to control them. Should it be images? Should it be, you know, and the same thing happens with Docker images. Should it be library? Should it be images? Do not trust stuff to bring into your applications. You have to validate them automatically and make sure uh, that you just take the things that you trust um, and, and you have validated. And, and don't let everyone just starting bringing stuff in uh, with no control, all right? All right, um, then we want to log everything because this is really, really, really critical. Um, and to final this, because I know I'm over time by a minute, um, you know, all of those problems it, are very critical to tackle, right? And if you start very late in the API lifecycle to do this, you're going to fail simply because it is very complicated to fix those issues once things are in production. And not only are they complicated, they're very expensive to fix once they're there, right? And we need to really hack ourselves. We need to write a lot of negative, bad tests, send us bad data, bad tokens, bad users, bad everything, not just the happy path. I call this the hacky path, right? Just go on the hacky path and hack yourselves and automate all of this. There's tons of tools you can automate right now to validate those libraries, those images, to find code problems automatically. Uh, don't rely on manual testing because it simply does not scale at the scale at which we're creating APIs today. And this is a huge problem, uh, a huge source of problems uh, for APIs, right? And this is, this is me, and this is the end of this presentation. Sorry if I just... Uh, went a bit uh, fast at, at, at the end. Um, I'll just uh, stop sharing now. I don't know if there is a question, uh, Arno. Thank you very much, Isabel. You are right on time for the next speaker. So if there are questions, you can answer them on the uh, chat window. Thank you very much. It was very instructive. And uh, now I'm referring to uh, expose APIs on the internet. Um, <laughs> I'll doing that. Um, good. You take care. <laughs> And now we will.